What's happening, everybody? It is Eric J. Olson, and we are doing another live recording of the Managing Partners podcast. So today I have Mayor Michael Wilds on the show. Hey, Mayor. Hey, Eric. How are you? Lovely to be here. Good. We're, we'll have to go into how you got that title, but uh, let me let the audience know a little bit more about you. So I'm going to read your bio. So Michael Wilds is the managing partner with the leading immigration law firm of Wilds and Weinberg PC. He is an adjunct professor at the Benjamin N. Cardozo. Is that, did I say it right? Yes, it's the managing yeah. partner with the leading. Uh, Benjamin nope. Cardozo School of Law. Okay, I could kind of hear a little bit of feedback there. Um, yep, yep. yep. And uh, so the School of Law in New York and teaches business immigration law and externship and part of the field clinic faculty. He's a former federal prosecutor with the United States Attorney's Office in Brooklyn between 1989 and 1993, and author of Safe Haven in America, Battles to Open the Golden Door. Having represented the United States government in immigration proceedings, Michael Wilde is a frequent participant on professional panels and commentator on network television. He has also testified on Capitol Hill in connection with anti-terrorism legislation. I bet that was super interesting. Let's talk about that a little. Happy Mr. Wilde's boutique law firm specializes exclusively in the practice of U.S. immigration and nationality law. It was established in 1960 by his father, Leon Wilde's, whose best known accomplishment was his successful representation of John Lennon in his wildly publicized deportation proceedings. That's super interesting. More than 50 years since its inception, the firm continues to serve a distinguished domestic and international clientele and covers all areas of U.S. immigration law. Some of Michael Wilde's recent clients include First Lady Melania Trump, famed artist Sarah Brightman, uh, Lionel Richie, Boy George, and many of the former Miss Universes, as well as soccer icon Pele. Wow. Very impressive. Thank you. Uh, Michael, and then last but not least, Michael Wiles is also the mayor of Inglewood, New Jersey, where he resides. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you. It sounds tiring when you listen to it, you know, um, but thank you. Uh, thank you so much for hosting me and uh, your reputation precedes yourself and your viewers should know that I consider this a big, a big honor to participate today. Well, that's fantastic. I appreciate that so much. Um, yeah, let's talk about the, the mayor title. Uh, currently the mayor? Currently the mayor. Um, just uh, breeze through a primary. The general election is in November. Uh, it will be my fourth term, God willing. It, there's never been a four-term mayor of the city of Englewood, New Jersey. It's a little hamlet, um, a bedroom community to Wall Street started in the late 1800s. And um, it's a real privilege, a city of an extraordinary diverse uh, base uh, and community. I got elected to city council, did two terms, then did two terms as mayor, took a break for 10 years to become the managing partner of our law practice, and now came back. You're allowed to be a part-time mayor, even though it's a full-time job. So effectively, Eric, I have two full-time jobs. I'm a managing partner of an immigration uh, law practice, Wilds and Weinberg, and also a mayor of a city. That must have been a very challenging decision for you to, you know, even consider running for mayor because just running for it is a full time job and then some. What what were some of the things that you thought about as far as what you needed in the firm before you could go do this this other activity, being the mayor and running for mayor? So it's an excellent question and something that I had to give a lot of thought with my family, my father, who's my senior partner, founding partner of the practice in 1960, uh, to have a good base good scholarship, good talent, to be able to onboard matters uh, properly and at the same time make sure that you um, have not only the ethical considerations of the law in place, but good client contact and management. So we have a very good team. I deployed a team in place to handle my matters so that if I'm turning my attention to a local matter in the city of Englewood, I have the ability then to pivot or if something comes up uh, in my political life, that I have the ability to then uh, do the same. So it's very important uh, that you find ways, and technology has made it so easy for us now to be able to draw attention and getting the greatest talent I teach 
generally two classes a semester at the Cardozo Law School. One is business immigration law, uh, finding the right talent out there and helping grow the practice for another generation is a key ingredient. Uh, this practice was started by my father uh, in 1960 before he and my mother rest us all started me in 1964. Yeah. Uh, we haven't missed a payment in rent even through the pandemic since 1960. We're in the same stinking building on the 53rd in Madison. We could have bought the building over about 150 times. Um, and uh, dad wanted to be in Midtown on top of a subway because it was so damn expensive to park there. And I expanded the practice then into Miami, into New Jersey and Englewood where I, I live and also by appointment only in Los Angeles. All we do is uh, US immigration law, visas, green cards, citizenship for foreign nationals coming to America. That is very impressive. Uh, how, you know, you mentioned the number of offices and locations you serve, but uh, how many lawyers and how many staff are in your firm? So we're about under 40 people, about 15 lawyers. Um, we have people with us that are with us more than 30 years. I try to staff up cases uh, with myself, a lawyer, sometimes a second lawyer or a paralegal uh, professional. Some of the paralegals have greater talent than the lawyers and vice versa and, and perspective. Um, we have five departments in the office. We do all business visas, the H visa, the E visa, the L visa, the O visas, that's hello. Um, I teach those in a law school. So anybody coming based on academics, based on investments, intra-company transfers, or um, talent of extraordinary ability coming to America. Um, we also have a robust family unit uh, where people get married. I marry people as a mayor. If they want to get a green card, that's where our office um, uh, steps up. Um, Family-based uh, sponsorship. Chain migration, as our former president likes to call it, but family reunification, which is a bedrock of uh, immigration policy and law. Uh, we have a robust litigation group in federal court, in the immigration courts throughout the nation. We have a compliance uh, division where we help people onboard into the workforce. So I lecture frequently to a lot of foreign students in schools when their parents are thinking of sending them here or when the kids are here and they're figuring out ways to onboard into the workforce with English as a second language and the kind of economy you have, you can imagine uh, the challenges that they face. And finally, we have a robust consular practice dealing with American embassies uh, and challenges and consulates, you know, US uh, 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 territory, so forth, uh, all over the, uh, the world. Um, it's a robust uh, practice. Um, we do everything from political asylum to EB-5, where people can literally invest and buy green cards. Uh, in America, and like my book says, Safe Haven in America Battles to Open the Golden Door, that golden door is open. It's on a hinge. I'm a former federal prosecutor, so, you know, we want to be able to shut it to those that would want to cause us harm, but we really want it to be on a hinge open to the greatest risk takers and entrepreneurs, and we see people regenerating this country in a post-coronavirus uh, world. Um, we see the American dream igniting itself and um, in the, in the you know, with our, our founding uh, parents and documents uh, had a vision um, of how this main ingredient of immigration would work. And we see it reconstituting itself beautifully each day. You know, uh, what I hear in the media is is mostly about undocumented, undocumented immigrants. And, um, you know, like, like you said, uh, at the founding of the nation, we we wanted immigrants. We we encouraged immigrants to come in. Has that changed at this point? So not the undocumented folks that are here that shouldn't be here. That's a different uh, topic. But the the ones that we invite in, what what is our policy these days? So you know, broad question, uh, easy to answer. The policy is dated, and the law is antique, um, and it's a shame because. Even President Reagan, who was more to the right politically, understood with the three million unlawfully present people in America, he had to do an amnesty. You can't have people living in the shadows that way. And he just gave them green cards. He then came up with a way to monitor and, and, and get full compliance, shifting the responsibility to employers to police immigration. But he literally gave three million green cards to people that were here illegally. Mm -hmm. They didn't trust him. They had to open up work authorization buildings on 24th Street in Manhattan because nobody wanted to go to the federal building. They thought it was a rig to get arrested and deported. Um, now we're more than 11 million people unlawfully present in the United States with a broken system, with presidents that are looking to play ping pong with the word immigration, Congress that 
are concerned that if they're strong in immigration, they'll be looked upon as weak on homeland security. Fox News and other networks that like to play with the uh, exceptions to the rule where, God forbid, a foreign national goes and commits a major crime trying to tell everybody that foreigners are criminals and so forth. So, you know, the policy has um, three major ways of coming to the United States. That's either based on employment, based on relationships, marriage, so forth, and based on investment. And there are paths on a temporary basis and permanent basis. And we always figure out if a person can or cannot onboard and what their challenges are. Uh, this is kind of like pregnancy in the legal uh, arena. At the end of a consultation, we can tell people yes or no, or maybe so, and what needs to be done. Um, and, uh, you know, we've I've testified on Capitol Hill in support of anti-terrorism legislation and immigration. My father testified in support of the EB-5, and we've, we've been players with major clients and profiles in um, major defections and whistleblowers, uh, cooperators, lots of U visas, uh, individuals who are cooperating with law enforcement and intelligence services that we've dealt with and, rep and gotten some of our clients through. Human asset intelligence is a specialty uh, of our practice because I'm a former federal prosecutor and we realized in the war on terrorism that there were a lot of people walking around this country with great intelligence. You know, our founding parents, Eric, didn't know that there are ways for to kind of figure out what it is that um, that they want to take advantage of our immigration system. We had to tighten it up and immigration lawyers in all truth uh, are in a position of trust and we help shape not only the workforce, uh, but we reunite families and we're dream makers and it's a wonderful uh, way to toil in the law. That's fantastic. That sounds uh, really um, impressive when you say it like that. So um, definitely appreciate what you do. Uh, how how do you go about getting new clients for your law firm? Do they come to you? Are you advertising? A little both? So, so, you know, we don't advertise. Obviously, social media is an opportunity, a platform for us to get the clients who have had interesting stories with their permission, of course, to tell the world about it. Um, it's all word of mouth. It's all th first, second, third, seventh, eighth generation. I can track clients back to the original beginning of a relationship my father may have had. Uh, or referrals from referrals. Hmm. Uh, I think the best um, way to get a client, in all truth, as a managing partner of a practice in Midtown Manhattan, is good results and good relationships. Um, clients are coming to us, not because my dad represented John Lennon or I had the first lady, Mrs. Trump, as a client, uh, but because of our scholarship, our reputation, our ethical propriety, uh, and good results. And then the relationship has a lot to do with the eye to eye contact, even in a Zoom, developing a personality. Uh, you know, if I'm wearing a suit or if I'm not wearing a suit, connecting with people according to what their needs are. I married um, a classmate of mine at Cardozo Law School. My wife and I, my wife Amy, and I met in my dad's class. Mm -hmm. And we have two kids now who are lawyers, and they took my class. So I realized early on when nobody asked me where I went to law school and I had this extraordinary family journey through the law school that I went to, that a lot was going to do with, with the gift of the relationship I had with my dad and his reputation and what I was going to do with that. So writing a book, teaching in a law school, making sure that I worked on the weak spots in my scholarship and finding the right talent in the office uh, develops those results and relationships. That's really interesting. Uh, yeah, I think the book is a really good idea for any business owner, right, about what you do and how you help your clients. And that right there is very good publicity. Uh, but you've also mentioned social media a couple of times now. What is your approach to social media and, and how do you do it a little bit different maybe than some of your competitors well, do? You know, we are bound by a professional code of conduct. So I can't post anything about a client without their permission. So I have an inventory of emails that I keep where I ask a client at the conclusion of the case, if I can post something, they say yes, they they you know edit the proposed uh, paragraph, they give me photos, they have the right to use, and we post it. Um, we also ask people to put up Google and, and, um, and Yelp and other reviews also so that it, it gets pedestrian traffic into the different offices. And then, you know, I, I have the good fortune of being one of the super lawyers and all these different um, caveats and groups that kind of help market you as well. So by creating these kinds of 
uh, content and pages on our website, we're in a position where people then will start looking for and finding us. Um, but I have to tell you, investing in that exclusively is not going to get you clients. It's all good. It's good old gumption. It's good old telling a client, you know, I'm going to um, do a good job for you. And if I do, can you tell your friends? More importantly, can you post it on your yeah, uh, yeah. platform? Because more people care about you. I'm doing work now with the permission. I have uh, permission for Sinead O'Connor, uh, Boy George, Mike Tyson. These are icons from, you know, a generation ago, but they all connect with U.S. immigration and people around them. And you wouldn't believe sitting in a Zoom where I've been able to connect in the last year uh, and then being thoughtful about it. And then you have clients sometimes who want their privacy preserved and you have to respect that. If we have good results in federal court or otherwise on immigration matters, I'll ask them if I can post it generally without their name. I'll still ask them because I don't want them to think that we're taking advantage of the relationship also. Yeah, that, that's really good advice. Now, uh, as far as have, uh, asking your clients to post themselves is probably much better than you posting about them. I'll be lucky what? if I get a charitable story. I'll be lucky <laughs> if um, they even respond to the email. Once we're done and dusted, the big guys and gals are, are on to the next thing while they're here in this glorious country. So, But, you know, you have to think about that. But you also have to make sure that you develop their trust and that you're not piggish about the kind of relationships yeah. that you have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, ha have you tried asking at different points during the, you know, the, the case, like either in the beginning, middle or end, uh, have you settled on one way of doing it? No, it's I, in the initial consultation, I'll say to them, you know, what's your policy about sharing the fact that I represent you? Um, well, you know what, let's see if we have a good result and we'll talk about it. Um, or we want our privacy protected, in which case, whatever. Or we have no problem with that. So then I'll ask the client, can I post uh, the fact that I'm representing you on your immigration matters? Yeah, no problem. Now, you run the risk if you screw up the case that just as much as what you put up mm -hmm. there can hurt you also. So be careful and judicious about what you put up there. Um, and also, if it's not really a major player in the field or somebody who's kind of in influential, um, it also could marginalize you. So you don't want to just keep posting what you get, but you want to be imaginative of why that person is special and what they're bringing to the conversation. And don't kid yourself. This pandemic cleared our calendars and our consciousness uh, for new conversations from Black Lives Matter, Me Too, and everything else. So don't, don't forget that as lawyers, we are not only advocates, but we move policy with the representations that we have. So that played a significant role in the last administration where immigration, like I said, was a major political ping pong. And I wanted to make sure that people got it right. I redouble my efforts to go on Fox News every time they want to trash immigration, despite the fact that I may walk off with a black guy. I hold my own and I try to make sure that they understand that they're not going to they're not going to rub our blue suede shoes the wrong way in this country on immigration. That's that's a great insight into you know, how the system works and, and why we've seen some of the things that we have seen in the last year or two. So definitely appreciate that. Uh, as far as uh, other kinds of marketing, you know, we, we talk about marketing a lot here because it, it's pretty central, we feel like, to getting new cases for law firms. Is, is there one area that, that you maybe wanted to focus in on in the next uh, couple of years and see if you could produce more leads through those avenues that something maybe you're not doing right now or something that maybe you're doing, but just want so, to see better returns. My theory has always been keep throwing stuff against the wall, something will stick. And you know, I'm relentless about trying to be out there and to be out there in areas that are where most lawyers in my space don't toil. So I will go to jewelry shows, to food and beverage shows. I will go to hospital groups, hotel groups, because there's robust foreign national needs that these groups have. First thing I'll do when I go to these conferences, I get all the magazines, I FedEx them back to the office, and I make sure that my staff, my team, and I are putting articles in all these magazines right. on the nexus to that space and immigration so that people can read this thing. Um, we also have the privilege because of Zoom and telecommunications to go to foreign countries, develop relationships with chambers of commerce, leaders, um, in uh, diplomacy uh, and, in, and, and in industry without having to get off our keister now. 
Um, in the past, I would go on planes. Sometimes clients would fly me uh, around the world in order to help them at embassies and with their consular work and so forth. Now it's become a different culture and we've been very fortunate. But in the next leg of this journey, um, I'm proud to say that my son will be joining us. So there'll be a third generation. He's currently working now for the immigration courts um, in Miami. Um, I think the task at hand as this world became more humble, the humility of what we drew from this pandemic is endearing. As it became certain that America's hospitality, its ingenuity, its vaccine, all of this played a major role in the human theater. Our doors are gonna be more open than ever before. The media, the entertainment, the music, the esports, the basketball teams that we represent, yeah. all of these industries are gonna be part of our curing of this social distancing. And people are going to want to get better traction. We saw so many people go through marriages, through divorces, all kinds of personal turmoil and travails. But I think what I'd like to do is get out into the diaspora from the United States, if you would. Um, it's interesting. I'm an observant Jew and I have a tremendous following in the Arab community. I think in many ways, there's something very beautiful about this Irish stew, this chulent, a food product my mom used to make on a Sabbath, that you put more flavors, more different people in it, and it comes out even richer. And I tell couples when I marry them, it's as if you have two different um, woven wools forming a tapestry. And over time, it gets even more brilliant, more valuable. And that's always uh, immigration in this uh, beautiful nation where we have um, developed and reconstituted ourselves uh, each time um, by the lessons learned in history and so forth. So I'd like our firm and our lawyers to be part of not only making history with the clients and the talent we bring in, uh, but going out and showing how special America is and how this next generation will not only take it to the next station, um, but will actually make it better than we got it from our parents. You know, that is a great counter narrative to the things that I hear all the time coming out of the media. It's just the opposite, right? So the problems with immigration, but the narrative that you spun is just, you know, it's about the benefits and why we have immigration and the fact that it's not a bad thing. And, um, you know, it's, it's just a completely different counter narrative and it's very inspiring and I appreciate it. The little anecdote, Melania Trump called me, said, Michael, go on CNN. I said, why? She goes, I need babysitting. I want my parents to be there so I can do the nation's work, <laughs> the first lady. Um, and it dawned on me that was just a humble thing. Whatever people thought about the president, the fact is she was eager to make appearances and be someplace and she wanted to leave her child barren with uh, her parents. So I think people will love and will work harder when they know they can bring family members here. I think the American employers who cannot find local talent in certain arenas will look the world over for it. Isn't it foolish from a business platform for us to allow people, foreign students to come into America, to get visas, to go to school, pay high tuition, and then not give them a way to onboard into the, into the different fields and practices and then we have to compete against them in another generation and get them back here. So, you know, we should be looking and I'll tell you this, you know, um, the greatest talent is what American employers want. And don't kid yourself, the humility of this pandemic made it such, I found it an abomination that nobody spoke, not one Senator, not one Congressman, that people that were here and were undocumented shouldn't get the vaccines. To me, we didn't realize the majesty of Mother Nature, that we are all in one boat together and we have to fix our broken immigration system so that we have order at the border, we have safety and we reconstitute a bad problem, but that we invest in those one million dreamers. I'll end with an anecdote. Um, and you can say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. That's a song from John Lennon's um, Imagine song and Yoko gave us special permission to use the Imagine song as our hold music. My father waged a five year battle against the Nixon administration and won the case. And he and John, a scholar and a legend, a dreamer, um, made the law. And out of the case that my father handled, a president 40 something years later, President Obama created DACA 
deferred action for uh, childhood arrivals. The scholarship of that law came out of the notion of prosecutorial discretion that my father discovered in the John Lennon case. Now, dad had no idea who John Lennon was. He was a scholar. He was a lawyer that toiled in the field. He changed the law for one man. And then the two of them discovered a system like a big iceberg that had so much weight behind it that another president 40 years later would do something. That's why he was asked to write a book about the Lennon case when they saw enrollment in law schools were going down. And that's why later on I used his example to kind of add the narrative of what we've developed in the practice after that. But don't kid yourself. Um, you in this field get to deal with dreamers and you are part of a process of keeping those doors open to the next generation of entrepreneurs, uh, inventions, and everything that our founding parents envisioned. That, that is great. Uh, it's a great story. It's a great journey that you've outlined for us, and I really appreciate it. Mayor Michael, what is a good way for someone to reach out to you if they want to continue the conversation? I have a question for you. Very kind, Derek. You can go to our website, which is wildslaw.com, or my personal email, which is michael at wildslaw.com. Honored uh, to have been here. Thank you for listening. And if any lawyers or clients have issues, by all means, feel free to reach out to us. Well, thanks so much, Michael. And if you would like to listen to more episodes like this of the Managing Partners podcast, you can check those out at arraylaw.com slash podcast. And if you are a managing partner and you are social media savvy or want some help, kind of like Mayor or Michael with his social media, you should have seen him taking screenshots before this. You can go to arraylaw.com and find out more about what my company, Array Digital, does for law firms just like yours. Thanks so much, Michael. Pleasure, Eric. Thank you. Right.